happy to have you uh, join us for this dialogue. Uh, we have Minister His Excellency Suhail Mazuri, who's the Minister of Energy and Industry uh, from the UAE, the Honorable Dan Bruyette, who's the U.S. Deputy uh, Energy Secretary, and His Excellency Sheikh Mohammed Khalifa Al Khalifa, the Minister of Oil from Bahrain. As I said, the topic is the outlook for hydrocarbon economies. We would agree that Abu Dhabi and Bahrain are hydrocarbon economies. I don't think, Dan, that we could exactly call the United States a hydrocarbon economy, <laughs> but it has become, hydrocarbons are certainly looming much larger in the U.S. economy than they did even a decade ago. And I think we can all agree that what has happened in the United States has changed the outlook for hydrocarbon economies. So I thought I might just begin by asking uh, our distinguished guest to say how the shale revolution uh, has changed global markets and changed their own economies and begin with uh, uh, Mr. al Missouri. Well, first of all, uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, with this distinguished uh, uh, gentleman, uh, Don and, and, uh, and Sheikh Mohammed. Uh, I think the, uh, at the beginning, there were some worries about this newcomer and how big is this newcomer going to be. Yeah. But I think for an economy like the U.S., it was needed. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, and, and, that, and that evolution uh, became a revolution uh, in a sense that it brought cost of finding hydrocarbon much lower than it was before. I remember this is one of the most challenging resources. It used to be one of the most challenging resources. The U.S. have excelled in the development of the shale oil, and uh, I think we helped uh, during the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the deal that, that we have done when the shale production started to decline. There was the uh, OPEC deal uh, with non-OPEC, and I think that, that helped it to, uh, to gain traction. But if you think of the world without it today, I think we will be suffering. The economy will be suffering. So I think the, uh, we, I personally believe that it's not a competitor. It's rather a complementing factor. The demand on hydrocarbon uh, has been healthy and has been increasing. And if it was if the, if the shale oil production uh, that reached uh, historical records today, if it wasn't there, I cannot think from where you can find enough barrels to replace it. So I think, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's needed. It also opens opportunity for other countries to uh, deepen their uh, resources and, uh, and uh, definitely the Gulf states have enormous uh, resources when it comes to the shale oil and shale gas. But I think what interests me more is the shale, shale gas, uh, where the price is today, uh, we were not even dreaming right. to see the, the gas prices where they are. I'm sure we will touch points on that well, later. I, I think your point that uh, it's hard to imagine how the oil market would function were, was it not for that volume of oil that's come in it. So Dan, from your point of view, as a non-hydrocarbon economy, but one in which hydrocarbons are very important, how has uh, shale changed the market and changed the U.S. economy? Well, Dan, I think it's been fairly dramatic. I mean, I'll just give you four uh, quick observations, if you will, and about U.S. history, and you obviously know that well, uh, living there. But, you know, we began uh, some years ago uh, somewhat dependent upon uh, foreign sources of oil. And um, our economy, like many economies in the world, are you know, largely driven by oil prices, the availability of oil, the availability of gasoline. Uh, and then subject to a few events and some, candidly, some perhaps misguided regulations in the United States, we had periods in our history in which there were ser severe so shortfalls of uh, gasoline and oil. And then obviously we've had a tremendous turnaround uh, in the last few years. And the point I'll leave you with is that, you know, I, I think that turnaround is due largely to innovation. And I think, you know, that alone has 
contributed more to the U.S. economy than anything else. We have changed some regulations in the U.S. We have done some things at the margin. But it's really been innovation that has driven much of this. And um, not only in the oil and gas industry. I mean, you mentioned earlier that you know, we're not a hydro hydrocarbon-based economy. The innovation didn't end with oil and gas. You know, it, it went on to renewables, it went on to other forms of energy, and that's given us a, you know, a very uh, diverse energy market, right. which but I think is... what about the impact on the U.S. economy itself of going from 5 million barrels a day to 13 million barrels a day? <laughs> well, uh, you know, obviously the economic impact is huge. I mean, the jobs associated with that sort of increase in production is enormous. And, uh, you know, I think we're going to conduct a study uh, in this administration that's going to demonstrate or at least illustrate uh, some of those numbers. We expect that number to be somewhere north of, you know, 11, perhaps 10 or 11 million jobs alone just in the oil and gas industry. Uh, much of that's been created in the last few years. So the economic impact uh, is very, very large. And, uh, you know, the other, the other you know, uh, point I'll, I'll make is that not only is it jobs in the industry, it's, as you know, all the subsequent jobs that are associated with the industry itself, manufacturing jobs, you know, those jobs that are, that are dependent upon stable, secure supplies of energy. And uh, those have increased dramatically as well. So it's been a, it's been a remarkable experience in the United States. Right. Mr. Al-Khalifa, on the impact on Bahrain, well, I think shale definitely is a culprit for bringing the oil prices crashing in 2015, but uh, oil remains only the second most important commodity. Uh, the, the most important commodity, if you can call it a commodity, is the U.S. dollar. And I'm a believer that uh, the roots of the shale boom really come from uh, the uh, quantitative easing. When we had the financial crisis, the U.S. economy went so much dollars were pumped in, uh, credit was cheap, so we made the dollar cheaper to access. But that went into a successful technology that was proven by then, it was fracking. And out of nowhere, four million barrels came out and uh, affected the world markets, and um, nobody expected the prices to fall 75%. So, w with prices where they were back in 2015, investments were withheld. Now, I, I try and dig deep in what is the true cost of shale, especially in the U.S. You know, the good thing about the U.S., and thanks to His Excellency, his information is very public, thanks to the government there. But you can induce what the true cost. And I believe the break-even cost of development in all, the, all of the basins in the U.S. is $60, soup to nuts. The challenge is you're given different costs that are only partial costs, either production. But you actually need $60 to make your entire investment viable. Soup to nuts, getting the acreage, drilling the well, producing the oil, paying whatever fees and taxes. We're not at that level with WTI. The pricing today is not at the level that's going to induce investment, unless you make credit cheap, right. which I don't think we are making anymore. Right? You make a very interesting point, of course, that mm. that other commodity called the dollar, without low interest rates, there would not have been the availability of debt that did really fuel the drilling as we're seeing now in some of the shakeout that's occurring. I mean, that's an observation and definitely the innovation right. created uh, a new source of oil. So one other response or reaction to uh, the shale revolution has been this OPEC, non-OPEC, OPEC plus. And uh, Mr. Al Missouri, I'd like to ask your perspective on that new relationship and from the viewpoint of Bahrain, which is participating, is this a new arrangement in the world oil market, and how's it working? I think since, the, since we, so we, we signed that cooperation agreement, uh, and I attended every meeting since then, the relationship between those countries who were non-OPEC, who have joined the efforts with OPEC, has been great. I think there was a misperception about the organization. Once they join in, including Russia, uh, they learned uh, that we are uh, an organization that uh, target the, uh, a healthy economic growth, but at the same time, maintaining the investment level that is required to continue supply the world with the desired resources. And 
I think that relationship is getting deeper and deeper. And last meeting in Vienna, all of the ministers have initialed or signed the draft, uh, uh, final draft uh, agreement that will keep us together coordinating for a very long time. So I think it's, uh, it's an agreement to stay. It's not something that is, uh, that is just came at, at a necessity and then it will, it will disappear. I think it's staying. You hear many presidents uh, of the non-OPEC talking about the importance of the agreement and their commitment to it. So I'm, I'm very happy with the commitment uh, of, uh, since we started. And I'm very happy that uh, we reached a point which was an aspiration for me to reach a point to sign something for all of those countries. Uh, and we are welcoming more countries to join in. It's not a cartel by any mean. It's rather a wise uh, producers who want to keep that balance in the market and try to, uh, to ensure that we would have this commodity that is in great demand for generations to come. Well, I know one country that's not going to join it, so I'm not going to ask you, Dan, anything about it. <laughs> but uh, Mr. Al Khalifa, what's Bahrain as a non-OPEC producer? What's your perspective on this new relationship? Well, we are the smallest producer in the region, uh, but nevertheless, oil and the oil price is uh, extremely important for where our budget is. Now, I was recently in a, in a very friendly crowd of I mean, people from Europe. And they turned a bit nasty when I started try trying to defend OPEC, you know, because OPEC to them is a cartel. But my argument was, well, maybe they're not. They're actually trying to help consumers more than producers. If, like me, I believe that the, you know, the economic cycle has happened since time immemorial. And it's, you're going to see a, a cycle of high, high oil prices eventually. How soon, it's anybody's guess. But what I know is the more investment is curtailed, the higher the oil price will be. Uh, it's still debatable, but are we at a level where investments are enough? And what OPEC uh, and with the non-OPEC group are saying is it's not. And the cost of incremental oil is no longer a few dollars. It is $60 and above. Because unconventionals, whether we like it or not, does include deep water as well. Deep water and that sense of cost is also unconventional. Your cost of incremental oil is no longer the cheap oil of the past. Nobody's discovering these easy to find anti clients that don't cost you a lot of money. You have to go after it with a lot of investment. And sentiment is the oil market, the future is blurry. Uh, but supply demand economics would tell you that you're looking at a sharp challenge in supply. And demand is not going away. Nobody's ever talking about reduction in demand. We're just talking about how fast the growth of demand right. is or not. But the challenge still remains is you're not getting the right level of investment to come back. And that's what OPEC and the non-OPEC are trying to do. But it's very difficult to explain this when everybody's branding OPEC. And Bahrain is not an OPEC member. If I can defend it without feeling like I'm, right. I'm a hypocrite. But, uh, but that's what they're trying to do. I mean, since 2015, a trillion dollars have been taken out of the investment programs. Well, well, we're talking about new production, what's going to happen. Dan, at the end of this year, the U.S. will be up to about 13 million barrels a day. Mm -hmm. At currently, and obviously projections keep changing, what does your EIA say how high U.S. production might get? And is there enough infrastructure to move the oil? Um, to answer your last question, last question, no. Uh, we need more infrastructure in the United States. And that means and, pipelines. And around the world. And ports, yeah. yeah. Exactly, pipelines and, and exports, uh, export facilities. You know, EIA, I've seen some models that go, you know, as you might expect as a professional economist, they're fairly wide ranging. I mean, we can get numbers as low as, you know, seven or eight or nine million barrels per day, and we can go as high as 15 or 16 or 17 million barrels per day. I think realistically, we're looking at somewhere between 13 and 14 million barrels per day, and that could go slightly higher as new technologies come online, and, you know, as we talk about new infrastructure coming online. You know, one of the challenges today is that we can produce a lot of oil, but uh, if you can't get it to market, there's no economic incentive to do so, to your point, sir. So well, t tell us about the problems of getting it to market in the United States. 
Well, in the United States, we have uh, you know, regulatory systems that are broken out. It's bifurcated in many respects, both at the federal, national government level, and also at the state level. And both governments play an important part in permitting new infrastructure. And what we've seen is in places like Texas, uh, where in the Permian Basin, a number, you know, a tremendous amount of oil is being produced, as well as associated gas with that oil, uh, it's somewhat easier, if you will, within the United States to permit a new pipeline in Texas. Not so easy in places like New York. So we have disparities throughout our country as to where this infrastructure can be built. Uh, but what we're going to see over the course of the next one, two, three, perhaps five years, uh, is a tremendous amount of new pipeline and a tremendous amount of new export facilities coming online. Right. Let me ask, obviously we're talking about hydrocarbon economies, let me ask about diversification of hydrocarbon economies. And um, what's happening in Abu Dhabi, how, success, how challenging it is or how easy, and the same for Bahrain. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I've, been, I've been talking in the opening about uh, uh, the need to diversify. Every country need to find what's available to it in terms of resources and develop a, a long-term strategy. I think countries should not have a five years or 10 years when it comes to energy. The time it takes to develop and the fluctuation on the market would dictate that you would have a, a diverse mix of, uh, of energy sources. What we found rewarding since we put our strategy, and we took a bold step toward uh, renewable energy when we did it. And, I mean, we started working on the strategy on, in 2015, and we finished it, we approved it in 2017. The strategy is calling for going from almost 100% dependency on gas to 50% dependency on gas, and the rest is going to be green sources with zero with zero emission of course at that time we were already committed to the nuclear program so we knew that nuclear program is coming but this is talking about 2050 so how much electricity we would have by 2050 and is it economical to commit at that time to it and we found it rewarding actually uh, making that commitment and offering a large-scale development. We helped, uh, we believe that we helped reducing the cost through those large-scale offtake agreements to the, uh, to the companies to help reduce, reduce the cost of solar PV uh, to a level today, I would believe, less than two cents per kilowatt hour. Right. When uh, energy is almost uh, the, the latest uh, award in Saudi Arabia, was very close to two cents per, per kilowatt hour. Who would imagine such prices three, four, five years ago? So I think if it wasn't a commitment where sun is truly available, I mean, if we, if Europe is going to promote renewable energy and us here where the sun intensity is at peak, we're not doing it, then something wrong. So we decided to do it. I think it's rewarding. And I think that balance between fossil and non-fossil always got to be right. there. We did, cannot replace right. one form with another. And did you say this morning your target is 70% decarbonization? Right? Yes, 70% reduction of CO2 emission is going to be delivered not only through the diversification. We have a, a plan to, uh, to digitize our cities, we have plans to reduce an action plan that is happening actually to reduce the consumption. We're working with the consumers. We're targeting to reduce the human, the, the per capita consumption in UAE by 40% by the year 2050. That's going to be a combination of behavior change plus the use of artificial intelligence and the use of, of, of smart systems within the houses and integrating solar and renewable energy within the household it's, itself. So that combination, plus Dr. Sultan was talking about uh, one of our uh, uh, prime projects, which is uh, carbon capture and utilization. And you hear him 
saying that Adnoc is going to bring uh, many more projects uh, to uh, to uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the to, to United Arab Emirates, where we will free natural gas, but we will utilize the CO2, taking CO2 from from air going green, all of these forms with the reduction of consumption, we believe can deliver a 70% a reduction in CO2 emissions. Yeah, I thought his comment, and now your comment about CO2 capture and use was actually very significant and very important in terms of emphasis and new direction. One other form of diversification I want to ask you about is diversification in your workforce about the role of women. Yeah, UAE is, is we are not a, uh, a very large population and uh, we believe in the empowerment of, uh, of all uh, of our nationals. And we historically, and, and this is something that we, we have in our DNA, people miss, have a misperception about the role of women even in the past. Uh, they characterize us as unfair to women, but women role in the society, in the old Arabia, I'm a Bedouin, and I know that my mother works probably more than my, uh, my father uh, in, in the house. And that work is not only working in the house. Women used to, to go to the market, used to, to, uh, to work, and that, that history that is shared among all of the GCC states and all of the Arab states, have given a woman a very distinctive role. I think we are going backward if we limit that potential of women. But we are not going to be just because a, uh, a female colleague is a female, is she's going to get privilege because she is a female. That is not fair as well. So we are trying to make equal opportunities and empower women through giving them the chance to compete and they have demonstrated and great capabilities. And the composition of your workforce is changing as a result. Yes. Right. Uh, Mr. Al-Khalifa, diversification in Bahrain? Well, it's, it's been a goal since the 70s and uh, uh, you know, everybody but the Minister of Oil is moving in that direction. Ministers of Oil want to grow the, the hydrocarbon sector. So in a sense, we're we are anti-diversification, but the rest of the <laughs> by, country... By your ministry, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, and of course, the role of women, they are slowly but gradually taking the driver's seat. So we're, we're gonna enjoy the ride. Uh, it's happening as we speak, and um, you know, they're achieving um, better grades in universities, they are entering uh, the disciplines that only men used to uh, do in the past. Um, you, you can see them on rigs these days uh, in the region. It's not a surprise to see uh, women from the region uh, as uh, operators of some of the rigs. Uh, so we're there. Uh, there's plenty of that uh, to happen. Now, as economies, we still depend on the export of hydrocarbons. You can't produce everything here. You, you lack fertile land. You lack uh, rainwater. Uh, we, we have to believe in global trade. Challenges, the volatility of the oil price is always uh, going to be a challenge. Uh, now, that also works into the, the role of currency. Uh, okay, $60 today, we are uh, pegged to the dollar. But what happened, if you look at prices today, if they were the same in 2006. But if you look at the imports of the GCC, and we are basically consuming economies uh, other right. than the hydrocarbon. That the Good point. Uh, the, uh, the imports and costs have not come down as significantly as the oil price has. All commodities have, but if you look at car imports, maybe even food, I don't have the numbers off the back of my head, but uh, I can assure you they did not drop as far as oil prices have dropped. They stayed at the level they were right. when oil prices were uh, above 100. So one qu question, uh, speaking about shale and unconventional resources, we hear about Bahrain's shallow water, unconventional shale potential. Can you tell us uh, anything about what's happening? I mean, thanks to the US, uh, this rock is now uh, understandable a bit more. So we've, uh, we've been studying what it has. We are uh, testing a few wells. Uh, we're also using it for the deeper gas formations. That opened up a whole new resource. 
which we're very excited about. Early days, but everybody in the region is certainly uh, putting their uh, efforts into it. Uh, I know Oman has done a lot and have now commercialized their Khazan field. And I'm sure uh, other countries in the GCC, hopefully including Bahrain, would be in a position to commercialize. Uh, we, we know now that a lot of it can be produced at uh, costs below where we thought they would be, even below the, the cost of our local market, which uh, makes it exciting for gas. So, so it is moving ahead? And it's moving ahead, yes. It's, uh, the resource base is there. You know, the source rock in the region is the richest anywhere in the world. But it's, we need to understand it a bit more. Uh, it's not as well tested as, say, the Permian, the Eagleford, or the Bakken. But right. uh, um, work has started uh, five years ago. Right. Well, we remain optimistic. So let me ask you a question about the other end of the value chain, and, and then Minister Mal Al Masrouri. I was quite struck to see that Bahrain has banned single-use plastic bags. Tell us why and what does the industry do about the plastics issue? And it's really a question for all of our panelists. Sure. I'm pro-plastics, but uh, I think... You're pro-plastic, pro yeah. The challenge is it's uh, the pollution they create, especially the plastic bags. See them on the streets sometimes, and as they enter the marine side, they affect uh, marine life. Um, well, for plastics, Probably the best thing is to, uh, and, and this is what a lot of the GCC countries are rethinking, is what do you do with solid waste? Now, maybe the best recycling concept, in my view, is not recycling the, the, the plastics themselves, but to burn them. And this is what I think Europe found out. And plastics have calorific value. If you take them away from solid waste from households, you lose that calorific value. We do not have enough uh, incinerators with the right flue gas treatment today to manage that very big problem. But eventually, I would think this would be the best way forward, you know, is, is to burn it, right. make sure your flue gas is treated well, and you don't emit anything, and then landfill whatever remains. Right. Mr. al Mazrouri, what do you think about plastics has now become one of the really big issues? I think, I think it's, uh, the problem has two sides. One is the human and one is the, the material. So blaming, blaming it all on plastic is not fair, I think, to the industry. But I think there is a realization among the petrochemical producers today that there will be challenges in the future, uh, regulatory-wise. And so everyone is trying to find solutions. For, uh, for us and our investments, we believe that uh, uh, R&D in the recycling and creativity in, in coming up with new materials that are fully recyclable is, uh, is the way to go. Uh, and uh, we are encouraging that. And we are uh, spending on R&D to come up with solutions to be able to recycle more of the plastic. The second is uh, we need also to help campaigners and to help campaigns to clean up the waste of human, I would call it, which is, which is the... And, and we are encouraging our companies as well to join one of the uh, uh, projects that I'm proud of that we participated in in Indonesia, which is cleaning the ocean. Uh, right. Uh, initiative. So there are organizations, and I would, I would encourage companies working in, in, in petrochemical to have part of their CSR uh, in cleaning up that waste. But I think we need also to become strict with those who are throwing away the plastic, because that's the source of the problem. Right. Dan? Do, what? We're pro-plastics. You're pro-plastics, pro <laughs> no, but it, not pro-plastics waste. <laughs> and not waste, yeah, not pro-waste. Uh, you know, I, I think seriously, though, we are, you know, uh, very supportive of the petrochemical industry. We think it has an important future uh, for a number of different reasons. But we're also encouraging new, new ways to deal with these issues. I was just in Denmark not that long ago, and I looked at their municipal waste uh, facility there. And to your point, sir, they burn it. They make energy from it. And there, there is, a, there is a, a new world, if you will, after that single use that we have to be cognizant of. And I think it's very important that we pursue those opportunities. Right. 
Uh, Dan, uh, many people may not know this. The U.S. Department of Energy is also the U.S. Department of Science and has the biggest responsibility for scientific research in the United States. And I saw last week that uh, you've just set up in the Department of Energy a new office of artificial intelligence. Why? What's the purpose? Well, uh, one's management. So, you know, the department is spread out over 17 national laboratories in a pretty big complex. What I mean, we're trying to have, do is... have, I think, the largest number of PhD scientists. That's correct. Yeah, in the U.S. Um, a, a very, very important role for the, uh, the department is the management team. We wanted to organize ourselves within our department uh, much more efficiently and effectively. So a little bit of this is consolidation. Uh, but importantly, it's to, to find new ways to apply the technology. If we focus on this, and this is one of the secretary's highest priorities, uh, if we focus on this technology, we can find new ways not only to develop new shale finds or perhaps new oil field finds, uh, we can help industry, consumers, end consumers, uh, utilize their resources even more efficiently, efficiently. So simple things like fleet management or turbine management, you know, wind turbines. Uh, managing a fleet of turbines is actually more complicated than a lot of people realize. But artificial intelligence will allow us to maximize the efficiencies all throughout the stream and uh, you know what we're learning now and what we're seeing now is absolutely remarkable. Sometimes you know we struggle with the right question to ask ourselves. Artificial intelligence will help us with the question as well as the answer. And that's a world in which we need to be accustomed to uh, because it's coming at us really, really fast. All right. And, and what about here in the UAE in terms of artificial intelligence and I think and, uh, and digitalization and these technologies? I think everyone and every industry is going to be benefiting from this revolution. Uh, this, uh, the, uh, the machine learnings and the, the Internet of Things and the artificial intelligence, digitization, smart cities, all of those are coming and coming at a pace that is higher than what we think. So uh, we need to prepare ourselves. And I think one enabler for that to happen is the communication. So the 5G uh, uh, as, as a mean of speeding, of increasing the speed of, of, of telecommunication is going to be uh, coming very soon. And that is going to, to enable the utilization. So for us, yes, in the United Arab Emirates, we are one of the first, if not the first country to have a dedicated minister for, uh, for uh, artificial intelligence. I think oh. the issue around artificial intelligence is the regulations. Who is regulating artificial intelligence? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are, there are things that are right or wrong, and every industry or every business have, have to have some regulations. That's, so we believe that that's an area of focus, and, and our uh, minister uh, uh, of artificial intelligence and his team, that's where they are focusing. But as companies, as uh, I think industries, uh, you see it everywhere you go. And it's coming, and I think it's going to, uh, to wisely use the resources much better than us as human doing it. Right. So uh, we are anticipating a significant reduction in the consumption as a result of smarter homes, and, and the artificial intelligence applications. But consumption as well as uh, portfolio mix. You know, one of the things we'd like to see it used for and what we're working very aggressively to do is determine what is the right portfolio mix for perhaps the lowest emissions. If you're, if you're an electric utility today, um, I don't want to suggest that they guess at this, but nonetheless, artificial intelligence is an important tool to help them find what might be the perfect mix of generation. Well, that leads to a very topical question, which is the role of nuclear in the overall mix. And as I was sitting here, I'm thinking at least these two countries are going in two different directions. You have a major new nuclear element coming in, and nuclear is somewhat retreating in the United States. So why the big commitment to nuclear here, and why is nuclear retreating the United States, and is that an inevitable retreat, or does it stop at some point? Sure. 
I think again, each country have its own way of looking at its, the resources that are available to it. So to us, uh, when we made that decision, we are thinking of 60 years. No one can guarantee that the gas as a commodity is going to stay where it is for 60 years. Who can tell you what is going to be the gas price in 10 or 15 or 20 years? But nuclear is not, we are not envisaging that nuclear is going to be a major component. It's a backup, it's a base load, it's the cleanest base load that we could find. And we elected to go with it because we don't have hydro. Uh, as Sheikh Mohammed mentioned, we don't have access uh, or, or abundance of, of water. Therefore, the, the available resources that are, that are available to us is the sun, and we could do nuclear. So we elected for a base load to go for nuclear because it's the cleanest. And and, and, and to complement that, we are going with solar. But we think with time, the batteries technology will evolve and would make the solar and the renewable energy a base load. Once that is happening, the nuclear is going to be around 6%. That's what we envisage. And 44% is going to be of our clean, uh, is going to be of our clean energy mix is going to be uh, uh, renewable, so the combination is 50%. That's what the, our strategy. But at the beginning of it, once we have all of the four nuclear reactors uh, active, the contribution of nuclear will be at, at the highest of 25%. And then gradually it will go down, but the technology in batteries, we believe it will evolve, and that's where the replacement of the base load, of a clean base load will happen and that's what we are, well, well, what we are uh, believing in, in our strategy. Right. Mm -hmm. And Dan, the fate of nuclear in the United States. I, you know, the nuclear industry is in, in the United States in a, uh, a state of uh, uh, inflection, I should say. Um, you know, the United States has a long history of building large nuclear facilities. And we're transitioning to a more distributed electric grid. So we're looking for smaller generation, not larger. Yet these plants have been built. And uh, you know, one of the things we've seen, one of the results of the, the gas revolution, and not only in the United States, but in many parts of the world, is that gas is really cheap. It's a very viable competitor to a large nuclear facility, especially if you're thinking about building a new one. So we're seeing that transition occur. Now, one of the other things we have to acknowledge as well in the United States is that we have a regulatory structure in certain parts of the country that force these nuclear plants into an uneconomic state. We subsidize certain forms of energy in the United States. And when you can bring those subsidies to an auction market and price your electricity at below zero pricing, well then obviously everyone is gonna be uneconomic in that marketplace, including the new, you know, the nu nuclear facilities. So we're seeing a lot of stress in that industry today. But I do think it has a bright future because it will move to smaller technologies. And one of the things that we are working on in those scientific laboratories is, a developed, uh, is the development of advanced reactors that are very small, one megawatts to five megawatts, some cases five megawatts to 20 megawatts, very small reactors that you can place in communities, you can place in smaller cities. Uh, there are many uses for them. Uh, the secretary and I just announced a new initiative to create specialized fuels that are accident tolerant, they're walk away safe, and we think these will come to market in the next few years. Uh, perhaps as, as soon as five years, we'll have approval for these very small nuclear reactors. And we do think in the United within States... Within five years. We think we'll have approval for the first one within five years. Right. Uh, and we think that that is the future of the nuclear industry in the United States. Right. Well, we've had, a, I think, a very illuminating discussion about the, out, both, the outlook for both hydrocarbon economies and also economies that have a lot of hydrocarbons. So please join me in thanking Minister al Mazruri, Minister al Khalifa, and Secretary Buryat for a very interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you.